Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, very glad to be with you today for another in our continuing series of virtual programs. And today it's something a little bit different, virtual voices of the game with uh, Jeffrey Urban. Jeffrey has worked for 20 years now at the Fed Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, Library and Museum, the Presidential Library and Museum in New Hyde Park, New York. Uh, we'll be join in Hyde Park, New York, I should say. We'll be joining uh, Jeffrey in just a moment. Um, before we do that, though, we do need to thank a uh, very generous support of our sponsor, the Ford Motor Company. Uh, they support this and all the other virtual programs that we do, our virtual author series, uh, virtual legends of the game, and some of the virtual field trips featuring our education curriculum. So we do thank Ford Motor Company uh, for their very generous support. As promised, we're joined by Jeffrey Urban. Jeffrey is the educational specialist at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. We thank you very much, Jeffrey, for joining us uh, during this presidential week. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about what you've been uh, doing. Your, your museum and library have been closed, but you're still working very hard. Well, thank you, Bruce, for, for having us on. We are delighted to, to be here and um, you know, to be uh, associated with the Baseball Hall of Fame is a, is a real thrill. Uh, yeah, we've been shut down like much of the rest of the world with the, uh, with the coronavirus. Um, but what we've done is we've shifted a lot of our, um, our programming to online like this. Uh, we have been doing um, distance learning programs for uh, teachers for over 15 years now. And so when um, the, uh, the move to the Zoom uh, began, uh, it was very easy for us to, to do that. And so um, I do probably 15, 16 of these uh, a week. Um, and we broadcast all across the country and in fact, all around the world. The farthest we've been so far is Australia, which they tell me is as far as you can go because when you hit Australia, you start coming back um, the other way. So although we are closed for the time being, we uh, still have plenty of online um, things you can, uh, you can partake in. Um, we have a YouTube channel, we have our, our blogs. Um, and so, and our, actually we actually have even a, um, a virtual tour. So if you want to whet your appetite here in the, uh, the winter, or hopefully when we get open later on, um, you can learn a little bit now and, uh, you know, and we'd love to see it in person, hopefully, hopefully very soon. That's very impressive. 15 programs a week. That's about three uh, a day per the working week. So you are definitely uh, keeping very busy there. You told me when we first met virtually about a week ago, you have been working for the Presidential Library and Museum for about 20 years now. How did this uh, get started for you? Was this a lifelong passion or did this job come about in more happenstance fashion? Well, I've always been a history buff, um, always been a government buff, and um, prior to working for the National Archives, which is actually who the, um, the presidential libraries are part of. So if you've been to uh, Washington, D.C. and seen the Constitution, the Declaration, uh, the Bill of Rights, that's actually our home headquarters, uh, the National Archives, and then the presidential libraries are part of that. So I've always been a history buff. I grew up here in Dutchess County, so the Roosevelts were always um, you know, in the background. And before I came to the library, I um, taught at our local community college uh, for 10 years. And then this job opened up. My sister-in-law, um, who happens to work for the Park Service, who uh, uh, operates the, the president's home right on the same property, um, said, hey, there's a job opening up. You know, why don't you um, take a look? And so I did. I applied. I was fortunate enough to, to get the job. I've been there ever since. And I'm telling you, you couldn't ask for a better place to work, with the possible exception of the baseball hall of fame. I'll tell you one thing that you've done that I'm, I'm rather jealous of. You've made a number of appearances on C-SPAN. Yeah, um, uh, I currently have a hobo talk on C-SPAN uh, right now. And then there's a couple of other things that I, um, that I was able to, uh, to narrate for that. So, you know, we're finding our ways to get out there to folks um, on Tuesdays. Uh, I'm sorry, Wednesdays, we do uh, a Facebook Live um, uh, every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. So I've done a number of those, and uh, as as our director, Paul Sparrow, and our um, museum curator, uh, Herman Everhard. So there's lots of ways for you guys to connect with us here in Hyde Park, even though you can't actually be with us here in Hyde Park. Let's give folks a sense of what your institution looks like. Uh, here is a great 
straight on photo of the library. And you can see right in the middle of the, the outer area is a bust of the uh, former president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The boss. Uh, so what's that? That's our boss, the boss. The boss, yes. Um, so uh, I love this picture. It's just it, it's just so stately in terms of its presentation. Is this where your office is in this particular building? My office was in that building uh, up until um, we built our visitor center. And what you're looking at there is the nation's very first presidential library, the only presidential library ever used by a president while they were actually president. Um, it's built in what's called Dutch colonial architecture, which is characterized by the large sloping roof built around a courtyard with a nice inviting porch, the little uh, six over six windows in the top and the dormers and the 12 over 12 windows uh, in the bottom. This building is actually uh, four stories tall. It looks like it's only uh, two stories. There's one completely underground and another one sort of sandwiched up there in the, in the top. And it was built from 1939 to 1940, opened in 1941. And uh, because it was built toward the end of FDR's second term, he was able to use this building all throughout his uh, entire third term and the 83 days into um, his fourth term. And in this building, Bruce, we have 17 and a half million pages of documents, which would be a stack 16 times as tall as the Washington Monument if you stack them all on top of each other. We have about 35,000 museum objects and there are about 50,000 books, 23,000 of which were um, actually part of FDR's uh, personal collection. So my office is not in this building. It had been, but when we did a renovation about six years ago, um, the office space was turned into um, gallery space so we could put more material out for folks. So my office is actually located in the visitor center, which is next door. Right. The timeline is very interesting and also somewhat coincidental with the Hall of Fame. We were constructed uh, from 1936 to 1939. 39 is when we opened. 39 is when the construction began for your library, took a couple of years and then officially opened in 41. Now is FDR, is he the only president to have actually used his own library during his term? Is he the only one? Yeah, he is. Um, in 1939, when um, he was getting ready to, he had finished out his second term. Uh, and so uh, the tradition had been to serve for two terms and then let somebody else you know, come in after that. But by 1939, Roosevelt was concerned about two, uh, two factors. One was uh, the New Deal and his, his legacy. Uh, many of the New Deal programs had come under attack in the courts, uh, things like the um, National Recovery Administration, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and had been overturned uh, by the Supreme Court. So he was afraid if there wasn't a strong Democrat to follow him in office that his, his New Deal legacy would be dismantled. The other thing that he was worried about, um, and, and far more, I think, um, was that by 1939, Adolf Hitler had consolidated his power. Now, one of the kind of cool and creepy things of, um, of history is that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt come to power within about 10 weeks of each other, and they die within 10 weeks of each other. Mm. So you have good and evil on the world stage at precisely the same time. But the way uh, our system works and the way the German system was working or the way that Hitler was manipulating it to work was that Hitler had just solidified his power by 1939 and was getting ready to try to take over the world. And um, Pre President Roosevelt's uh, second term was coming to an end. So he said, well, this is probably not a good time to break in a new president. Maybe I should run for a third term, see what we've got going on with this guy and um, you know, see where we go from there. And so. Uh, the library was completed and he ran in 1940 and he was able to use the office in the building from uh, uh, 41 on to uh, his death in 45. Uh, yeah. Jeffrey, one thing I've always been curious with about presidential libraries, we know that there's a lot of personal documents, uh, artifacts mm -hmm. uh, from that particular president's life and career. I'm curious also, do presidential libraries, do they typical typically contain the personal reading materials of presidents, maybe books that they didn't necessarily use for their work, but just books that they enjoyed. Is that something typically that's done and is it featured at this library? It's totally featured at this library. FDR was a huge collector um, and he, uh, he collected uh, books. 
Uh, he had about 23,000 books in his personal book collection, and wow. these range all the way from his personal books when he was a child, um, all the way on up to, uh, you know, books that he was purchasing up until, you know, his death. Um, and then he also bought, went back and bought, um, you know, classic books and older books as well. So he's got about 23,000. Um, most presidents are not quite as... Um, compulsive about their book collecting, let's say, but yeah, presidential libraries would con con contain books. And when people hear the term library, they think, oh, library, books, library books. Uh, but as you, you said a moment ago, Bruce, we have, um, we have documents, we have reports, we have pamphlets, charts, graphs, uh, letters, posters, um, you know, you name it. Um, if, if it uh, relates to the presidency, we've, we've, we've got it. Was there a particular genre of reading that he really gravitated toward? Well, he loved the Navy. And so he had an incredible naval collection of, of books. Um, he was uh, he served as assistant secretary of the Navy during the First World War, which, as it turned out, was a great um, uh, dress rehearsal for him when he became commander in chief during the Second World War. And he, uh, sorry about that. And he also um, collected um, mystery novels, uh, you know, really? just cheesy, you know, paperback mystery uh, books and such. And so he liked to uh, to read those as well. He actually wrote one at one point as well, but yeah. um, mostly he liked to read them. Was he a fan of Sherlock Holmes? Um, I don't think he. Uh, I don't think he was a fan of Sherlock Holmes particularly. Uh, you know, the, the the general genre of the mystery kind of thing is what he was yeah. looking at, and I think his taste ran a little more toward the uh, cheap paperback novel than, you know, a classic like like uh, like Holmes. Here we have a photograph from the museum, and the museum is essentially in the same building as the library. Tell us about this room we're looking at here. Correct. This is one of my favorite rooms uh, in the entire museum. This is President Roosevelt's desk. This desk was actually given to President Hoover um, as a gift, and um, President Hoover used it for his entire four years that he was in office. And then when President Roosevelt became president um, in the throes of the Great Depression, didn't have time to be running out buying office furniture, so he just moved right into the Hoover desk that was there. President Roosevelt used this desk for the entire uh, 12 years that he was president. And then when he passed away, um, President Truman used this for about, uh, I don't know, six or eight months or so. Then he gave the desk to Mrs. Roosevelt, who then gave it to the um, to the presidential library. So it's the only desk that if you go to the presidential, to a presidential library, it's a, it's the only real live desk used by a president. The others are, um, are reproductions. And mm -hmm. I love to go into this room. Um, as you can see, it's, it's, um, it's, it's surrounded by the four freedoms, uh, you know, Roosevelt's uh, famous four freedoms that uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, you know, really personified in the portraits. And um, really everything that Roosevelt was doing throughout his entire presidency through the Great Depression and the Second World War um, were to promote the four freedoms, you know, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of expression and freedom of religion. And that desk is so awesome, you know, and sometimes when I find myself overwhelmed by, you know, events of my day, um, I'll go over to the museum and I'll just sit in that room quietly on that bench to the right and think about, you know, all the tremendous decisions, the 44 programs of the New Deal created at that desk, the plans for D-Day created at that desk, uh, the draft for the um, D-Day prayer created at that desk, the drafts for the 29 uh, fireside chats created at that desk, um, you know, plans for the, uh, you know, five major um, World War II conferences with the big three, uh, you know, crafted and created at that desk. So yeah. when I find myself overwhelmed and I go and I think of all the tremendous work that was done at that desk, it kind of shames me back to going to my desk and continuing on with a, with a sense of, of part shame, part determination. Gives you a little motivation. It looks to me like it is completely behind glass. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it, uh, prior to the renovation um, in 2013, it was not behind uh, glass. It was simply behind a, uh, a, a railing, a wall, basically, a, you know, like a, a waist high wall. Uh, now it's, it's preserved in glass. And that is because the objects on the desk that you see there are actual objects that Roosevelt had on his desk um, in the Oval Office. And if you go around the back of that, there is a kiosk there and you can, it's a touch screen and you can mm -hmm. um, press on pictures of the objects and it'll bring up the information uh, about the objects. But the objects on the desk 
we're actually, you know, in museum biz, we call them artifacts, um, yeah. are, are made of a great number of materials. So there's metal, there's uh, leather covering on the book, there's cloth uh, animals, there's wood, there's um, ivory, there's ceramic. So all of those things need to be very carefully uh, preserved. And of course, the desk itself is, is wood. So we have to be very careful in terms of uh, temperature, lighting, and also uh, humidity. So it's safer if it's in the, uh, in the glass. But as you can see, the gentleman behind there, you can step right up to the carpet and go right up to the glass. And, you know, you're really only about a foot away from everything, but it is, you know, behind the safety glass. Yeah, beautifully done. Really, really uh, fantastic. Uh, this is a room uh, that I especially love. Uh, tell us uh, which, this was his personal office in his mansion, or this is part of the museum? This is part of the museum. This oh, the is, museum. This is President Roosevelt's uh, office in the in the uh, presidential library. It is not a reproduction or a recreation. It's the actual office that he used while he was um, in Hyde Park. He liked to get out of Washington as often as he could because um, you know he had polio and he wore very heavy leg braces made of steel and leather. And so it was very hot. This is, you know, before widespread air conditioning. So he would love to get up to the Hudson Valley with all the beautiful um, breezes along the Hudson. So this is his, uh, his office. And um, you can see, uh, uh, if you look really carefully in the back there, that little picture off to the left, that's mm -hmm. a picture of his mother. It's about three feet by three feet. And uh, there's an interesting story behind that. When FDR said he was going to build his presidential library on site, he had a small office in the home, which, of course, was his mother's home. And when she found out he was going to move his office to the library, she was like, well, I don't know why you're going to do that. You have a perfectly good office right here. And so she was a little bit um, bent out of shape about it. So uh, when he went ahead with the plans and built the, the office, um, the portrait was given to him by his mother. And some people say it was given to him as a peace offering, as if to say, well, okay, you know, you're going to go have your office and, you know, gee, what would be a great thing for you to have in your office? Oh, I know, a portrait of me. And others say it was given to him as an act of spite to say, okay, smarty pants, go on over and have your office. But uh, you know what you're going to have in there? A portrait of me. So we use this as an example of, you know, you can have a historic fact, you know, there's a picture in that office, uh, but you can have a, uh, also a historic debate as to what the actual nature uh, of how it got there is. The other thing that's really cool about this room is if you look at um, the, uh, the rug, that rug was given to the president by the Shah of Iran. And uh, the rug has, as any good Persian rug, has uh, about 100 knots to the square inch. And the knots are so small, they had to be uh, tied by children. So the, um, the rug took 10 years of child labor to produce. And when the Shah gave the president the rug, he was very proud of the fact that it had been so carefully made and so carefully done. And Eleanor Roosevelt was, was appalled that you know, the president was accepting this gift of child labor. Um, but that's, you know, that's the, the story behind that. And then the other thing that's really neat about that there, of course, is the president's wheelchair. And if you'll look, you'll notice that it's nothing more than an ordinary kitchen chair. Uh, the legs have been cut off of, it's been uh, off the chair. They've been placed on a metal frame, big wheels in the back, little wheels, uh, I'm sorry, big wheels in the uh, front, little wheels in the back, no arms on the chair. And this was so that FDR could um, wheel himself around and then get into you know, regular uh, furniture. You'll also notice if you look closely, there's an ashtray there on the side. FDR was a big time smoker. And as we always like to say to the kids when they come in, today he is dead. So think about that if somebody offers you a butt. So that wheelchair, he constructed it himself? He designed it himself and then had it, had it constructed. Uh, wheelchairs in the 1920s and 30s were, were like almost like uh, um, porch furniture, you know, big wicker affairs, and they were very difficult to get from one spot uh, to the other. So this is kind of like a sports model of a wheelchair, yeah. really, and very maneuverable. And uh, FDR was able to... Um, to get himself around in this. He didn't spend a lot of time in the, um, in the wheelchair. You'll notice there's a little cushion on there. Uh, the president had polio, which is a disease that actually um, destroys uh, uh, neurons in muscles, but it does not destroy the neurons that affect uh, feeling. And so he could feel his legs, but he couldn't move them. And 
because he had gotten polio when he was 39, uh, his leg muscles and his butt muscles had basically atrophied. And so when he sat, he was sitting pretty much on his, his spine, his, his butt bone. And really? so it was very, very painful. So he would use that chair just to get from point A to point B and then get into uh, far more comfortable chairs. Jeffrey, you mentioned the rug a moment ago, and it is authentic. It certainly looks authentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's got to be, what, 80, 90 years old? Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I and assume this whole area is cordoned off. People can't actually walk through it, but they can get a pretty close look uh, of everything in the room. Right. The way it's set up is um, the uh, this uh, uh, what you're seeing is as if you were standing right up against the glass looking into the room. So you can step into a small portion of the room, uh, but the rest of it, the part you're seeing here is, is glassed off. And the, um, the books that you see in the back in those, in those cabinets are part of FDR's uh, book collection. Um, and he had, like I said, uh, 23,000 of those. And right behind that lamp on his desk is a little shelf that's pulled out. And that is his guest book. And whenever yeah. folks would visit in Hyde Park, they would sign that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of famous signatures, uh, you know, from that time frame, um, from people who came to visit him uh, in Hyde Park. So um, that's a really cool book, the, the big book yeah. of everyone. Uh, that's fascinating. This is a shot of the mansion itself. Uh, looks like it's in pristine condition uh, from the outside and looks rather large as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the home. It, it started out as a uh, small farmhouse when his father built it, and then they added on uh, a couple of times and turned it into the mansion that you see there. It's actually uh, owned and operated by the National Park Service. And, um, you know, I just only wish it looked that good today with the beautiful sun and the big leaves and everything. Uh, the building itself looks great, but the um, right now we're covered in about 18 inches of snow. Yeah. But uh, FDR loved this home. It was called Springwood. And um, you can see a little ramp there in front that is... Um, uh, the, the stairs there uh, with the little railings is how he would get up there. And um, he entertained all kinds of folks from around the world, including uh, the King and Queen of England uh, came and stayed in that house in 1939, just prior to the Second World War. So he loved that house. He was born in the second floor uh, uh, bedroom upstairs off to the left there. And um, he uh, lived there his entire life, except when he was in Albany as our governor or uh, Washington as our president or as assistant secretary of the Navy. So this house is operated independently from your museum and library? Yes, we, um, when FDR passed away, he gave his papers to the National Archives, uh, which is who I work for, and he gave his home to the National Park Service. So there are two separate federal um, agencies uh, operating on this, what was once the Roosevelt property. So the Park Service uh, manages the president's home uh, across town, Val Kill, which is Mrs. Roosevelt's home, um, up the street, the Vanderbilt Mansion, um, which is also part of the National Archives, or, I'm sorry, part of the National Parks, and the National Archives operates the Presidential Library and the Visitor Center that services all of the, all of the sites. How close is this building to the museum and library? Oh, uh, less than, less, less than probably 75 yards. So very close. Yeah. So somebody going, planning a visit, even though you're close at the moment, hopefully that'll change in the near future. People planning a visit, they can go to the museum, the library, and the house easily in one day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would suggest you do that. All right. Let's talk about the baseball connection. Um, we're going to talk about the green light letter and the red light letter. We're going to talk about FDR encouraging Commissioner Landis to keep the game going during World War II. Mm -hmm. But here's something that maybe is not as well known about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He absolutely loved the game and he was passionate about baseball, not just in terms of a business sense of keeping the game going during the war. He just loved the game, period. That's absolutely right. He um, he was not especially good at playing the game, um, and he had been on a couple of teams as a youngster, um, not not doing particularly well. He found his real calling uh, in managing of uh, of the teams, and so he was the manager for the uh, 
the team um, uh, at uh, when he was at Harvard. Uh, but he absolutely adored baseball, and um, he loved to play, even though he wasn't, you know, a great player. Uh, he loved to watch. He loved to, um, you know, see how the games were going. He loved to follow uh, various teams. Sometimes he would have little friendly wagers with his um, aides and advisors about who might win a particular game. And um, he got to the games uh, as often as he as often as he could. Geographically, I'm going to guess he was a Yankee fan. Is that true? He was a baseball fan. Baseball fan. How's that for a political? Uh, oh, that's all right. Uh, he if he had a root for a team, he would root for the Washington Senators because those, of course, sure. were the home team. Absolutely. Of course, they had a franchise throughout much of the 20th century before relocating to Arlington, Texas after the 1971 season. You had told me earlier that in college, he was actually the equipment manager for the varsity team. Yeah. Yeah, again, he, um, you know, he wasn't out on the field, but he had his hands uh, in what he was doing, um, or, you know, what was going on uh, with the field from the management standpoint, you know, and of course, you know, we know him to be, um, you know, a great manager as president, um, you know, managing first the Great Depression, and then, of course, uh, the Second World War. So um, that's really where his his skills um, lay, but his interest certainly laid with what was going on out there on the diamond. You'd also mentioned that there was an amateur team that he had some interest in, followed very closely. Yeah, Lowell Thomas, who was a, a big uh, media radio guy back in the day, uh, lived also here in um, Dutchess County over uh, on the other side of the county, closer to the Connecticut border uh, in a pl place called Pauling. And um, he had put together sort of a, a Sandlot Bush League uh, sort of a team. Um, and FDR um, would occasionally have uh, opportunities to go over and, and watch the games over there along with Lowell Thomas. And he absolutely loved that because, um, you know, I think part of it was the fact that the players were a little bit closer to his skill level. You know, they weren't professional players, um, but he was able to um, get right up to the to the uh, baselines, you know, with his with his uh, car. Of course, you know, he was um, limited in his mobility because of the, uh, the polio, but he would sit there and he would hoot and holler for the teams. And uh, it was a great way for him to, um, you know, break the burdens and the monotony of, of running a country through a Great Depression and also uh, through a world war. So he was really, um, that was sort of his home, his home team, um, you know, love. It sounds like he really enjoyed the experience of being at the ballpark. It's, it's one thing to listen to the game on the radio which is really the primary way that he could have enjoyed the game through media at the time. But it sounds like being at the ballpark, that was the thing for him. Yeah, it was the whole baseball experience. You know, um, it wasn't just, um, you know, like you say, experiencing the game through the, through the, through the radio. It was experiencing the, the game through the fans, you know. Uh, what was the re reaction of the folks in the, in the stands? Uh, what were the... Um, the facial expressions, the reactions, the body stance, you know, the, the, the mood, the tenor, the tone right there in the stadium, you know, while some one team was ahead or the other team was, you know, working to catch up. Um, you know, he loved this to him. This was a way to, uh, I suppose in a way he was living um, sort of the same emotions and things that he felt when he was in the political world, except um, he didn't have necessarily a stake in the game like he might in the political world, but he absolutely loved uh, baseball and he and he really believed um, that it was it was a, a purely American sport. You know, it really was representative and symbolic of what America stood for. You know, the idea of, of uh, fair play, the idea of uh, clean living. You know, being out there in the in the uh, you know in the fresh air. Um, you know, taking your turn at bat. Uh, you know, trying to advance yourself around the bases and such. And, you know, it was interesting because he even used baseball analogies in his speeches. Um, mm -hmm. When he was asked to describe the, the New Deal, and if you ask the average person, can you name some New Deal programs, they'll probably be able to spit out, you know, three or four. But there were actually 44 programs of the New Deal. Uh, it was a very complicated set of, um, of government programs designed to get the country moving again. And some of them worked quite well. Some of them didn't work quite well. And so he um, used the baseball analogy of, I don't expect to hit a home run every time I come to bat. What I'm looking for is getting the highest pass possible batting average for yeah. myself and for the team. So he understood sometimes it was just going to be base hits. Sometimes he was going to strike out. Sometimes he hit the home run. Yeah. Um, but he, um, he used that analogy 
to um, to drive home what he was trying to do. And people really understood that because they understood baseball so well. Did he typically throw out the opening, the first pitch opening day at Griffith Stadium? Was that something he did regularly? In fact, he not only did it regularly, he, he holds the records, uh, the record for eight uh, consecutive uh, tosses of the first ball. Um, he wow. failed to do that in 1942 um, for obvious reasons. We had just, um, you know, gotten into the into the Second World War. So, yeah, he holds the um, he holds the record for that. And in fact, he'd actually thrown out the opening season ball in uh, 1917 um, as assistant secretary of the Navy. He was filling in for Woodrow Wilson who was busy um, with the First World War and asked uh, FDR if he would go and toss out the ball. So um, technically, I guess you could say he did it nine times, but um, eight times consecutively. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's remarkable because, you know, his health was obviously a concern, very limited in terms of mobility. Mm -hmm. And even though he had that kind of charged up wheelchair that you mentioned, it was very slim down and sleek. It was not easy for him to make that effort, but apparently he did it every year. It's amazing. Yeah, he um, they had built a, a ramp for him at the stadium so that it was easier for him to get in and out. But um, he was a little self-conscious about doing that in front of everybody at the stadium. So uh, he probably would have gone to more games if it would have been easier to get in and out without, um, you know, kind of being the center of attention. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, you know, uh, had polio. Everybody knew it. Um, but what most people didn't realize was the extent that he uh, he was disabled by it. Um, you know, he, really, he literally was not able to walk or, or not able to stand. And so he wasn't ashamed of that, but he didn't want people talking about what he couldn't do in the typical Roosevelt spirit going all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt, he wanted people talking about what he could do, not what he couldn't do. Yeah. So he um, definitely downplayed the uh, the disability, but it didn't keep him from getting to the first game of the season. Here we have something we're going to talk about in a moment. It is the famed green light letter. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a copy of it on display here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, we have the original as well. Your museum has the original red light letter, which is not as well known, but is still significant. Mm -hmm. The red light letter was what was written by the commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And it was a letter basically asking for advice. What should we do? We're losing all of our top players to the military because of the World War II effort. Minor leagues are going out of business. It's going to be hard for us to field competitive, major league quality caliber baseball. Uh, should we continue the game? Should we shut it down? Should we suspend operations? Um, I've actually, I've never seen the the, the original um, red light letter, having not been to your museum. But tell us a little bit more about the tone of the letter and, and what exactly Landis was looking for, why he wrote it. Okay, um, I don't know if you can see my, uh, see me on the screen, but here is a copy of the red light letter. And uh, you can see it's written in longhand. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting about this, and I'll get back to this in just a minute, is it's dated uh, January 14th, 1945. And basically what, um, what Commissioner Landis is saying to FDR is, you know, ordinarily we'd be getting ready for spring training around about this time, you know, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we're, we're in this world war now. So what do we do? Um, you know, do we play baseball? You know, is it appropriate to be playing baseball at this time? Um, you know, not just from the standpoint of, you know, those that should be in uniform and could be in uniform ought to be in uniform, but is it going to be a frivolous thing? You know, we're in a two front world war fighting in the Pacific and fighting in, um, you know, in the, uh, in Europe as well. Um, is it frivolous to play baseball? And, um, you know, how is that going to look when we've got baseball scores on one page and then you turn or, you know, you, you have uh, bat, uh, battle casualties on one page and then you turn and you've got baseball scores on the other, you know, what should we do, Mr. President? And um, Roosevelt wrote back to him and he wrote back to him and I've got a copy of the green light. Oh, you got it up there as well. Uh, but notice that I pointed out a minute ago that the, the, the commissioner's letter came in on the 14th. The president's letter went out on the 15th. Hmm. So President Roosevelt wasted no time responding to uh, the baseball commissioner. He, he sent the letter out the very next day. And he sent it out as an unofficial letter. He said, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do as president, but here's what I think. And basically what uh, FDR said was that um, we needed baseball, you know, that baseball had to go on, that um, people were going to be working long hours now. They needed some recreation, uh, some distraction. 
Um, he suggested maybe that they increase the number of night games so that um, people on the day shift could get to a game at night. Uh, the president, you know, reasoned that a baseball game only lasts two or two and a half hours or so. It's not a lot of time out of someone's week. Uh, it's not a lot of cost to go to a baseball game, at least not in those days. And um, that those who could be in uniform ought to be in uniform, but that baseball could continue with older players uh, or players that were not qualified to get into um into the military service. And Roosevelt really believed that this was something that, um, that needed to go on for the good of the country as a distraction to all the turmoil and all the, um, you know, the trauma that was going on um, you know, with the Second World War and the way that we entered the Second World War with the surprise attack uh, on Japan that happened just five weeks before this, these, uh, this series of letters went back and forth. So I think it's really significant that Roosevelt got back to him the very next day. That's how important baseball was to FDR. That's how important F FDR felt baseball was to the country. And that's how important FDR felt baseball was to the war effort. Interesting that Landis's letter was handwritten how does he address him? Does he say, dear Mr. President? Did he use his first name? I'm curious about that. He, he says, dear Mr. President. Um, uh, uh, he's very he's very respectful of the um, of the office of the president. And as the president is of the uh, the job of being the baseball commissioner, you know, the president doesn't say, hey, I'm president. You know, Mr. Roosevelt doesn't say I'm, I'm president. And here's what I think you should do uh, with baseball as president. He is um, understanding and respectful of the fact that the decision needs to be made by the baseball commissioner and the, um, the team manager. So he says, unofficially, here's what I would do. And, uh, and so he, he uh, writes it back that way. Landis and Roosevelt were not, um, were not exactly, um, uh, they weren't exactly friends. Uh, they weren't enemies, but they were at far opposite ends of the political uh, uh, the political spectrum. Landis was a very conservative gentleman. FDR, of course, as you know, was, was pretty liberal. And so um, I think what's, what's cool about that is that baseball even brought together the two ends of the political spectrum into agreement on the fact that baseball should, uh, should continue on. So um, uh, they were both very respectful of each other and the position that each other held. Yeah, that's interesting that uh, you know, they both are very polite, very proper in the way that they wrote their letters. But uh, as you say, and as, as Kurt Smith, presidential historian and uh, former presidential uh, script writer or speech writer, uh, Kurt Smith has told me a number of times that, uh, yeah, they did not really see eye to eye on too much, but they were able to put the differences aside in terms of this very important decision. And I guess that's to both their credit. Yeah, the, the love of the game and uh, understanding what the game meant to um, to people, not just in a, um, you know, in the sense that it was a game, but in the sense that it was part of the very fiber of what America stood for. And, you know, with the war, what we were fighting for um, was democracy. We were fighting for freedom. We were fighting to end fascism. We were fighting for you know, literally, and it sounds corny to say it, but we were fighting for um, the American way, right? We were fighting for, um, you know, decency and fair play and apple pie and baseball and mom and all those sorts of things. So baseball um, certainly had a great, um, a great seat at the table when it came time uh, for the Second World War. And baseball, I have to say, also pulled its own weight. Um, baseball games, ex exhibition games and such were used to help support the Red Cross, uh, the United Services Organization, the USO. Um, war bonds were sold at baseball games. Um, the uh, baseball um, Digest offered a special uh, rate that if you bought um, two copies, <clears throat> two uh, uh, subscriptions, one for yourself and one for a serviceman, you would get a discount on uh, on your subscription. So, um, you know, baseball really pulled its own weight and, and um, you know, helped through the war. We've highlighted here on the screen a couple of the very key passages from the green light letter. And this is what FDR wrote. I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed and everybody will work longer and harder than ever before. The president then goes on to write, and that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. 
So not a direct order, not a command, but um, kind of a, a suggestion. This is what I would do. And I guess you could read between the lines if you're Landis. You could say, well, if the president, if this is what the president would do, maybe I should go along and do that as well. And of course, that's what he ended up doing. You mentioned a moment ago, Jeff, about increasing the number of night games. Was that something that Landis arranged? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, it was FDR who threw the switch for the first night game. Um, I think it was April of uh, 35, uh, Crosley Field. Um, and uh, so he threw the switch for the first night game um, for Major League Baseball. And um, yeah, Landis went ahead and said, oh, that's a great idea. You know, what we can do is we'll, we'll do some more night games so, you know, uh, folks can work in the factories uh, during the day and get home, clean up, have dinner, get to the ball game and, um, you know, have a nice night of of recreation, fresh air, uh, you know, an escape from the factory, an escape from the burdens, and uh, just, you know, lose themselves in the game for, uh, you know, a couple of hours. Now, this is interesting. You mentioned about throwing the switch for that first night game, which I think was 1935. Yeah. Was that symbolic or was there actually a connection from Washington to Crosley Field in Cincinnati? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the, the child in me wants to believe there was a connection. Um, but to think of there being a, you know, 1500 mile long uh, extension cord, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, the idea was that the president uh, of the United States, and it happened to be Roosevelt at that time, um, you know, was, was casting uh, baseball into a new time, a time that it usually wasn't played, nighttime. And this opened the sport up to so many more people. And, um, you know, it was, it was an opportunity to, um, to, again, throw some support behind baseball and, uh, and quite frankly, uh, an opportunity for FDR to, um, you know, kind of rub up against and be in the, in the baseball mix a little a bit again, even if he was just only throwing a, throwing a switch. Yeah. You know, by the 1940s, they had made some improvements in the lights at the ballpark. Those first lights in Crosley Field were, you know, relatively dim. Uh, there's the famous story of, you know, Johnny Vandermeer throwing one of his no-hitters in a night game. Crosley Field, the lights may be not that effective for the hitters, an advantage for the pitchers. But by the mid-1940s, some improvements had been made. It certainly did make sense on all fronts to start playing more night games, and that was a tremendous boost, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, really just a, a fascinating relationship between FDR and baseball. Do you think if he was not a baseball fan, do you think he might have said to Landis, eh, suspend baseball for a while? Let's play it by ear. Do you think his, just, just your hunch, what, what do you think his reaction might have been? I think even if he wasn't a baseball fan, but of course he was, so it's difficult to really remove ourselves from the from the speculation. But I think even if he wasn't a baseball uh, fan, I you know he he was a smart guy and he understood the American people. You know that was part of the reason they elected him four times. Uh, that was part of the reason the fireside chats went over so well because he was just talking to regular folks. He understood who they were. Uh, what they wanted out of life and what they were looking for. And so I think even if he were not a, a personal baseball fan, I think he certainly would have understood what baseball, uh, you know, uh, means to the country and certainly meant to the country, um, you know, at that time. So I think he, he would have gone, um, gone ahead with it anyway. Interestingly enough, you know, after the green light letter, uh, there were other sports that contacted the Roosevelt administration asking for their own green light letter. Uh, bowling, uh, horse uh, racing, um, golf, uh, and the president either said no or, or ignored those uh, requests. So baseball was set aside as, you know, the, the sport that needed to, to be continued on uh, and, uh, you know, endorsed with that, that, uh, that green light letter. So baseball did continue during the war in 1942. Uh, opening day took place as scheduled. And I think as you indicated earlier, uh, FDR did throw out the first pitch, even though it was wartime. He was at the ballpark. Uh, actually, he wasn't at, in 42. Oh, he, he wasn't. 40, okay. 41 was the last. Yeah. And then 41 was the last. Got tangled in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he was there in back, spirit. Yeah. When you look back at, at FDR, he was actually nearing the end of his life. We didn't know that. But he would die in April of 1945. He would die only three years later. Mm -hmm. Um I'm curious about those those final three years of his life. 
Had his health declined considerably during that time? Was his death anticipated or was it something that was a complete shock? Well, I, his, his health was declining. Um, he, um, of course, he was a, a, you know, the perfect candidate for, for uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, he smoked two packs of camels every day. He enjoyed his cocktails. Uh, he had the most stressful job in the world. Um, and he had that job for 12 years, first with the Great Depression, then with the World War. And because of the, um, the polio, he wasn't able to get any real cardiovascular uh, exercise. Right. So as he got older, um, you know, his, uh, his health began to, uh, to decline. But he had this incredible ability of always bouncing back. Um, and that starts, you know, um, when he's, you know, when he's young, and you really see it with the polio, you know, when he got polio, um, 1921, everybody said, all right, that's it, it's over, you're done. And he said, no, no, I'll be back. And sure enough, he was back. And so very often when he would um, find himself with his energy and his, his health lagging, he would um, go to Warm Springs, Georgia, where he had a convalescent hospital there uh, for people with polio. And he would spend some, uh, some time, a couple of weeks down there in the, in the warm Georgia sunshine and the warm mineral waters. And he would generally uh, bounce back from that. Um, in, uh, he died on April 12th, 1945. And just a few weeks earlier, he had just gotten back from Yalta, uh, the big wartime conference at Yalta. And that was a 44,000 mile trip. And he was exhausted. In fact, it was the only time that he addressed Congress when he came back and gave his report to Congress that he was uh, sitting down. And he actually even made mention of it. Um, you remember, he didn't like to draw attention to the fact that he couldn't walk. But he said, you know, you'll have to excuse me for the unusual posture of, of me being seated. But I've just returned from um, from Yalta. And it's, you know, it's just too tiring to stand with 10 pounds of steel around your legs. So yeah. he gave that, um, that speech went back to um, uh, to Warm Springs, Georgia, and was really planning not just uh, the, the closing weeks of the war, because he died just, uh, you know, five or six weeks before Germany surrendered, but he was also working on plans for um, going to San Francisco later in April for the very first conference of the United Nations. And so he was planning for the post-war period as well. Mm -hmm. So um, those around him saw that he was, you know, he was tiring and that he was, um, you know, becoming more and more worn out. But, you know, he was working 16, 18 hour days, you know, fighting a world war. And, um, you know, he always had bounced back. So everybody, I think, just sort of hoped he would, he would still be able to do that. Harry Truman was only president, uh, vice president, 83 days. And then all of a sudden, Wingo, you know, you're president and, you know, you got to wrap up this Cold War and, uh, you know, plan the post-war period from there. So I think he was the one that that had the hardest time with it. I think also it's important to put this in context, especially for some of our younger viewers. You say polio and it's eradicated in the United States today. It's been eradicated in most countries. There's, I think, just a handful of countries where there are still a few cases Mm -hmm. They're hoping one day that it'll be completely eradicated from the globe. But back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, maybe even into the 1960s, this was a feared disease. Some people were forced to be in iron lungs. I mean, people were terrified of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, polio was a horrific disease. Um, and it was horrific because it struck without warning. You would be fine one day and you would be infirmed the, literally the next uh, it hit different people in different ways. So you could have three people in a family get polio. One might end up with, um, you know, a, a limp and a lame leg. Uh, another might end up in an iron lung uh, because they're they just weren't able to to you know maintain uh, breathing anymore. And the other might end up with something um, in between. Uh, Roosevelt con contracted polio at the age of 39. So he was a grown man yeah. and uh, went to bed one night up at Campobello, his retirement home up in uh, uh, just between the uh, little island between the United States and Canada, said, oh, I'm feeling a little stiff. I'm not feeling so good. I'm going to go upstairs, go to bed. And the next morning uh, he was unable to walk. And he uh, the polio initially had impacted his entire body. He was so weak, he couldn't even lift a soup spoon. Mm. And eventually it settled in his, uh, in his legs. He regained his upper body strength. And he created um, this place, uh, well, he bought a, uh, an old uh, resort in Warm Springs, Georgia and created a, uh, a convalescent hospital there 
for victims of polio. And he created an organization called the March of Dimes to uh, help to fund that. And originally the March of Dimes was created to help fund infantile paralysis research. And it was with the funding from the March of Dimes that Jonas Salk created the, uh, the vaccine in 1955. Um, and then um, uh, the uh, oral vaccine came about with uh, Dr. Sabin in 1962, I believe. So we don't worry about polio anymore uh, because of, of Dr. Salk and Dr. Uh, Sabin. And um, the funding was, uh, was put forth by the March of Dimes, which FDR created. And that is why the next time you find yourself with some pocket change, you will find the boss, FDR, on the dime. He was placed on the dime as a tribute mm. uh, to his efforts to... Um, to uh, raise money through the March of Dimes. And, um, you know, they, I think they raised something like, you know, over $16 million of just people sending dimes to the White House to uh, wow. help white infantile paralysis. Remarkable, he lived 24 years beyond the diagnosis, but uh, accomplished so much in that uh, span of time. We have just a few minutes left with the uh, Jeffrey Urban, who is the educational specialist at the FDR, Presidential Library and Museum. We do wanna take some questions from the audience. So let's do that right now. Uh, we have a really good one from Annie Lindsay. Annie wants to know, did FDR or his wife, Eleanor, have any support or involvement with the All-American Girls Baseball League, which sprang up during World War II? That's a great, uh, a great question. Um, the Roosevelt's were big fans uh, of the uh, of that league and also the Negro League. Who um, both of those leagues kind of stepped into the um, the void that was left from uh, uh, pro professional baseball having to sort of uh, you know pair back uh, and such. So they were they were fans. I don't know that they um, did anything particularly to um, you know in terms of fundraising or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, for the um, for either of those two leagues, but they certainly understood the void that they were filling, and they were uh, very pleased about that. Of course, Mrs. Roosevelt was always pleased about anything that would advance um, uh, women in in any line of work, whether it was journalism, uh, or uh, and I say journalism because Mrs. Roosevelt was the first uh, first lady to have her own press conferences, and she would only allow female reporters to come to her press conferences because the president would only allow male reporters to go to his. So um, she would certainly be a fan of, of the advancement that uh, you know, uh, was, was put forth through that league, especially the whole idea of teamwork, the whole idea of um, you know, working together and just the values that, that baseball you know, brings to, to a person through, through play. There was a geographic separation as well. The All-American Girls League was primarily in the Midwest or actually almost exclusively in the Midwest. Uh, there were no franchises in Washington, uh, so that might have prevented uh, the president and the first lady from having a more active role. Um, we have a very interesting comment, Jeff, from somebody that I think you know, Darian Rivera. <laughs> the name may be familiar. Uh, he's got a long message here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to read it. Uh, regarding the Hyde Park Robin Hoods, that was FDR's favorite team. They were a minor league team in Hyde Park, I think Class C at the time. FDR and Art DeGroff were good friends. I assume DeGroff was a player. Uh, separately, FDR and Lowell Thomas started an informal league, modified baseball and softball league. FDR understood that baseball is part of American culture and history. Uh, I used to work with Jeff for a decade. Great program. You must remember this gentleman. Uh, sounds a little familiar. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Gary Rivera is one of my favorite people on planet Earth. And he is um, uh, a tremendous guy. He works now for the Library of Congress. He worked for us for 10 years. And he is uh, as big a baseball fan as you're going to find. He taught me much about baseball. Hey, Darian, look, I've got my mitt ready for, uh, for spring uh, once the snow gets the way out there. And uh, Darian actually created a uh, baseball curriculum guide for us, um, I'm going to say probably 15 years or so ago. So um, thank you, Darian. Thanks for watching. Thanks for the, for the comments and thanks for the information. Before we let you go, I, I want to ask you, you, you had some artifacts with you. You did show us a copy of the red light letter. Show us some of the other items that you have in your office. Yeah, we've got some, some cool stuff. You know, uh, President Roosevelt was a big baseball fan, but um, a lot of baseball uh, is tied to um, the presidency uh, as well. A lot of these guys were, were baseball fans. 
Um, here is a quote from Herbert Hoover about uh, baseball that was um, painted on the side of a building. This is about four stories tall, you know, <laughs> and he's, he's promoting, you know, the, the good sportsmanship and the values uh, of, of baseball. And um, so the Cincinnati Baseball Club wrote to him asking, hey, can we, um, you know, quote you on some of your baseball stuff? And he said, yeah, not only that, I'll give you a bunch and you can pick one out. And, and they did, and they put it up here um, on the side of the, of the building. Here we have a, um, I've got a letter, uh, these, that's from the uh, Hoover Presidential Library. Mm -hmm. And here is a letter um, from Babe Ruth to uh, President Truman. Now Babe Ruth at the time was uh, in a New York hospital um, with terminal cancer. And um, he invited President uh, Truman to come and uh, watch the premiere of the Babe Ruth story. And um, President Truman was not able to do that, but he, um, he wrote back a letter to Babe Ruth saying, look, you know, best of luck and uh, I would be there if I could, but the burdens of office uh, prevent mm. me from, from doing that. So Babe Ruth had a, a nice connection to presidents. Um, in 1930, a reporter pointed out to Babe Ruth that Babe Ruth's salary that year was $80,000 and that President Hoover uh, presidential salary was only $75,000. And uh, the reporter asked, you know, babe, would you like to comment on that? And he said, well, I certainly had a better year than Hoover did in 1930. So um, that was that was Babe's reply um, uh, to that. Um, that's why Hoover did not uh, go see the movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that was Truman. Yeah. Um, oh, Truman. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then um, there was a, um, a baseball game where there was the, the, the perfect pitch uh, the perfect game pitched in the in um, in uh, Major League uh, by Don Larson, and so here is um, uh, a letter from Eisenhower, uh, you know, congratulating him. Now Eisenhower was no uh, slacker and was no um, stranger to you know incredible feats, you know, like D Day, mm -hmm. and so to see a perfect game pitch that way um, was was really a thrill for him. So he writes this letter to, to Larson and then Larson, Don Larson writes back and says, well, Mr. President, it was a great thrill for me to play that game and to pitch that perfect game, but it would have been a greater thrill if you could have been there uh, hmm. to see that um, as well. So it's, um, it really runs the, you know, the thread of baseball runs throughout um, the, the, uh, the presidency. Um, here is a letter uh, from um, John F. Kennedy to Jackie Robinson. Uh, congratulating him on, you know, the, uh, the baseball, uh, you know, breaking the barrier, uh, the race barrier. And this was, um, yeah. and being admitted to the Hall of Fame. And this was uh, written at the suggestion of Martin Luther King. And so President Kennedy said, well, you know, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. And so wow. he wrote this letter uh, there as well. So baseball and the presidency go hand in hand, you know, and it's, it really is um, the idea of, of the American sport, you know, what America is all about. And uh, it's a dream that so many kids have. And, um, you know, if, if you can't grow up to be president, grow up to be a baseball player. Jeffrey, one last question from David Lukander, I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, he wants me to ask you to mention the packet of documents that are sold in your gift shop about baseball and the presidency. David is a teacher. He says he uses those in his history of baseball class and they're great teaching resources. Awesome, good for you, David. Um, yeah, we have a packet of, of, uh, of, of these uh, documents that I'm showing you here. There's, I think, 15 of them all together. And um, you can uh, get those through our, our gift shop, which unfortunately is closed at the moment. Um, and they are, they're a wonderful uh, uh, teaching tool. We, uh, if you go to our website, we also have an, another wide variety of, of teaching tools that you can use there, um, curriculum guides um, that we've created that also include primary source uh, documentation and and, uh, and those sorts of things. And what's nice about, again, baseball and using these documents to teach about, um, you know, the things that you're, the issues and themes you're going to see in, uh, in social studies is that, you know, baseball is a great entryway for that, right? You know, um, you tell a kid, hey, I'm going to show you some documents, 
you know, and it's like, oh, yay. Uh, but hey, I'm going to show you some baseball documents, some really cool, you know, Babe Ruth, you know, Don Larson, some of these really cool documents. And they also happen to relate to things that we're talking about in a larger context. And you, you know, you now have um, the, the kids attention. And so you're able to, um, you know, to work that through. So good for you, David. I'm, I'm glad you're using those. Final question for me. It's a simple one. Uh, tell us about your website, how people can learn more about the library and the museum. Great. Well, if you go to our website, you can just, you know, Google um, FDR uh, Presidential Library. Um, that'll bring you, you know, to the thing you click on to go to our website. You go to our homepage and um, there's a bunch of stuff you can do there. You can examine our archives by going to our archives section. Just click on there. We have a thing called Franklin, which is a search engine, which will allow you to have access to a million pages of documents um, from our 17 and a half million pages. Uh, if you are um, interested in some of the talks that we've had uh, at the library over the years, you can go to our public affairs uh, tab, click on that, go to events. And we've got, um, I think about 40 or so, um, uh, film, uh, you know, uh, talks there uh, that, uh, that C-SPAN had done for us. Um, mine's not on there yet, but, um, and then you can go to our museum section and you can take an actual virtual tour of the museum. Um, you can go to our YouTube page and see clips of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt um, doing, you know, official things. We even have some home movies of when they were uh, having an Easter egg hunt uh, and an Easter egg, um, you know, carrying the spoon across. So there's fun stuff there. There's historic stuff there. There's a wealth of information that you can learn. I mean, we spend an hour here, a wonderful hour, in my opinion, talking about FDR and baseball. And there is just so much you can learn from, um, you know, your local presidential library, which we happen to be uh, for here in New York. But there are 13 presidential libraries in the system. They all have um, great education specialists. They all have great offerings, great programs. And so, um, you know, while we're waiting for spring training to begin, maybe you can uh, check into some of these presidential libraries. And I would certainly hope you consider yourself to have a friend here in Hyde Park. And when things open up again, come on down and, um, and see us and I'll be happy to show you around. Yeah, we'd love to go there. What's the full URL, Jeffrey? Um, it's um, fdrlibrary.marist, M-A-R-I-S-T, Marist College, dot edu. That'll so you're affiliated you. with Marist. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they run our server. Oh, interesting. Okay. And you can also do the Google search as well. Um, please let us know when you do reopen. We'll certainly pass that word along. Jeffrey, we really appreciate your time. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Great. Thank you so much for having me on, Bruce. Goodbye, everybody. See you at spring training. That sounds good. Spring training starting this week. Again, our guest, Jeffrey Urban, educational specialist at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. We do appreciate his time. We also wanna thank our sponsor, the Ford Motor Company, uh, for making this and so many other programs possible, generated uh, here from Cooperstown and also today from Hyde Park, New York. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great day.